project, and I don't have to shout while doing it, which is uh, running since three years. It's a European-funded project that uh, involves various partners and in which we have a tech stack that we actually produced that is all made in Clojure. So I thought it would be interesting for you to understand um, how actually is the impact of Clojure, even in the you know, production world. Actually, if you know European projects, uh, research projects, they don't actually all have a concrete outcome. This consortium uh, uh, tried to put forward quite some ambitions, and we are building actually tools that are usable and they are production ready. The tool that I'm telling you about is the most experimental one in all our research, and the rest of the tools are actually worth it looking at. This is uh, a little bit of a, of a vision of how we work. We follow pretty much the lean methodology, so we run a lot of research on the ground before starting working uh, on the software. We are a consortium that includes also universities, among them the Economic Department of Sorbonne and the, the Universidad Obierta de Catalunya. So basically we tried to involve first a lot of researchers that are into the humanities and then translating the specifications that they have done about the problems we observed and into sort of personas and trying to make a specification for developers. We worked uh, with uh, excellence in the field as a company, a, a way bigger company than my organization, ThoughtWorks. And by working with them, we realized that uh, closure was a good idea. So what we do uh, in our uh, project in this uh, decentralized citizen engagement technologies, we looked at collaborative platforms for the emergent political movements and grassroots movements in, e in Europe that started to raise up their constituencies, to self-organize, and to actually change politics as we think of it today. So we uh, worked uh, very closely with movements that are not necessarily hierarchical, they are not vertical. We even analyzed with big data analysis all their Twitter feeds and whatnot. So it's very clear, especially by the research and some deliverables that you can find, that these new movements like uh, the Pirate Party, a little bit more marginal, Podemos, who actually has already two mayors in Spain and four people in, in, uh, in the parliament in Europe, these parties, they really don't work like T uh, typical parties. They have a very dispersed way of uh, communicating. It's not always the leader that brings forward the issues. It's like someone into the network and then it responds. It's really like a mesh networking of concepts. So we are absolutely interested into this and the Commission uh, sponsored this project also because uh, basically um, Europe has a problem and is participation and trust into the real um, political process. So here you can see some of the resources we produced. They are uh, in uh, various languages, Spanish, Italian, and most of them are being translated, uh, all of them are being translated in English. So you can see videos and interviews. We are about at the end of this project, and uh, I think that the results are uh, worth it. So, uh, my organization actually got involved into this, um, and it's pretty uh, new to us. It was our first uh, project of this kind. Actually, it brought a lot of uh, activists into our organization to the level of actually sustain our, our uh, uh, agency uh, on a part-time level. The pays are way lower than the commercial world for developers, but if you really like and love the project, then it's also a pleasure to work with it, at least on a part-time. And we come from a very uh, old school sort of thing. We run our own IRC network. We don't even think of Slack. And we run a, 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 a museum of uh, old computers that is in Sicily with working Vax VMS and Data General Eclipse and PDP-11 that are all working. Actually, you can even carm it into their, 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 their terminals. Uh, so we are total nerds and geeks on this sort of things. And um, actually, we really appreciate simplicity into the way things are done and doing it the good old Unix way. So for us, system D is horror. Um, the architecture of this, uh, of this software that we worked on um, is very modular. So we understood, we had a complete understanding also with other technical delivery partners. What we should be doing is not one software to rule them all. We should do components that can be reusable also in other situations. So we ended up having this uh, four set of software that you can see here. And uh, the first one was Objective 8. 
which is a deliberation, a collective deliberation pl uh, platform. And all this software is written in Clojure. Eh? It's written in Clojure. I should also say the specification, it's written in Clojure with some Clojure script sometimes, but it doesn't require JavaScript for uh, being interacted with, which was also a requirement for compatibility and for security issues. So basically, Objective 8 is a delibera uh, deliberation tool. So you can uh, put an objective. You can propose what we call an objective. People can comment on it, can recommend the changes, can fork it and propose a parallel objective. And then the person that has proposed it at a certain point can call for a vote. When this vote will be up, then the objective will be actually drafted and uh, people will be able to read it and uh, possibly go forward with it. All the actions that I talk with, they are broadcasted in activity streams too, which go to this application, Mooncake, which is a activity stream consumer, also written in Clojure, that basically takes all these uh, uh, units of uh, uh, events and displays them into a uh, list of events that have been done and also can provide them to other uh, programs in the meantime. Then there is a Stonecutter, which is the single sign-on tool, which turns out to be one of the most interesting uh, components also for uh, other projects. It's uh, featuring um, OpenID Connect, which is actually an improvement of OAuth 2, and it's compatible with OAuth 2 and uh, basically runs uh, as an uh, identity man management system, so it's a single sign-on. In, in the moment in which you have the uh, logins into that uh, software, which basically handles how you can resend emails, like you forgot your password, and how you put your avatar, and not much more, then once you have your login in there, basically every new service that you put up will be able to be logged in with the same user. And then we have Freecoin, which is what my organization mostly uh, focused on. We have a background in uh, cryptographic uh, applications, and we have also a background in the most infamous uh, project of the last uh, five years, which is Bitcoin. So basically, we tried to look into ways on how this sort of cryptographic technology can really be useful beyond the hype without saving actually the criticism of what everyone talks about the blockchain today. So. This is mostly the tech stack, like in general, that has been used be within our organizations. Um, this, these are mostly choices led by ThoughtWorks. Now, in my organization, we have most expertise on C. We even have assembler programmers. Believe it or not, they still exist. So basically, for us, it was a really hard choice. But when we saw Clojure, we thought of Lisp. And, um, and we... You know, many of us still use Emacs, and why, why change that? And so no ELISP, and many people that come from computer sciences or linguistics, like myself, we actually did a big deal of LISP. So when we saw it, our reaction was not exactly the same as when someone comes to us with a Python or Ruby or Perl script, which is like, you know, not so positive, or, or you know, like... <laughs> something like Nope.js, you know, like we, we actually were a little bit more interested, you know, like this is Lisp, so you really have like this approach. So we do know that inherently, if you program functional, you end up making way less mistakes. So you can actually open up your team also a little bit more, and, uh, and it's a good way to think. So actually, we didn't act like the graybeards that we are, as usual. So. Uh, since the organization that, uh, that we were working on is way bigger than ours, we decided, okay, if we are real programmers, we can just jump on a language uh, from day zero. So actually, my story is the story of a noob, because I code closure since, uh, I don't know, it was uh, less than a year ago, like probably nine months. So I started uh, looking up the language. I read The Joy of Closure, which is a book that I recommend. It's pretty good. Then I looked up the meetup. I found up the meetup in Amsterdam, which is full of great people. It's really like an amazing community. And uh, actually, I started pitching around Clojure quite a lot. So eventually, I would be really able to make money with Clojure. Although we are a nonprofit, in my case, it's not really good. But uh, I, I'm working uh, with, uh, yeah, this is the, the software that I was telling you about. So in the meantime, uh, what I'm doing, uh, I'm getting really excited about Clojure, especially on the front end side of things. 
And uh, personally, I'm involved, uh, most of, our, of the people we work with are in, pu in public sector. So you can imagine like civil so society organizations or even governments or like in the process of institutionalizing. So uh, actually into this uh, sector, it's really well understood in the moment in which you talk about the fact that re a code can be read well, that you can get people involved, that you have a full unit test coverage and uh, actually that there are many advantages in Lisp. So I told you about this, I wasn't switching. So coming to Freecoin, why we thought of Freecoin is because beyond our research on actual democracy and participatory democracy and all this sort of stuff, we thought, okay, it's really nice to be talking about good proposals and good intentions and in politics this happens all the time. But there is a fundamental problem when it comes to decisions is uh, where is the money going? You know, you take a decision and then it's a collective decision, even for small organizations, then you put the money in the hands of someone that should follow the objective and then it's not exactly clear how it has been spent. Perhaps it was like completely kosher the way it was spent, but still people want to see the process, want to have more transparency on these processes. And this is not really private sector, so we are for transparency, full transparency into this other uh, uh, sort of uh, context. So we started uh, thinking of a system that can actually track all the movements of the money that is put into an organization by the means of creating complementary currencies, so involving also economists in understanding what this means, because it's not only making a funny money or a token, actually this deals with multiple complementary currencies, so you need to have hours uh, matched to, for instance, a work package uh, that you work with, and then you get the token that you can check out every month or not. Or also we observed cases in which companies can have a circuit in which they actually exchange their productions and have people like a bar buys beer to a beer maker, or and the beer maker will, will buy bottles from another company. And in these uh, sort of systems, especially in poor countries, in, Italy, in, in countries that are getting poorer and poorer, have a big uh, crisis in liquidity. They don't have immediately the money, but among them there is trust and there is a lot of uh, uh, activity even. So what we try to build is also this sort of commercial credit circuits in which you can have a complementary currency that you use and you check out at a certain point on the promise that will enter. This is also valid for organizations working for public sector that have a contract and their money will enter way later, so you can still create some liquidity with the, the, the organizations you work with. So we started tinkering about all these cases. One thing that we realized immediately is that these cases are too many to be covered by one software. So we started thinking of this as a toolkit, and we are trying really to code it in a way that is adaptable, that is uh, documented, that is fully covered by tests, so that if you change it, you can be sure you're not breaking something. And uh, it's, it's basically a tool that we envision a team of one coder, one uh, uh, economist, and one front-end developer can actually deploy on a mission going into a place and trying to study a specific currency for that place that can work for those problems. Because mind you, money is the most used medium in the world. So you're dealing with an extremely complex uh, medium that people have used in very different ways and it has attached a lot of cultural values and perceptions to it that are very different across different cultures. So you cannot just invent a complementary currency and think, you know, it's going to work for everyone. You have really to be on the field and understand what people do with it because ultimately the objective is not money but is wealth for the people living in that place. So in brief, this is a little bit the elevator pitch. That, uh, um, that we go around with. And uh, we hope to finish it uh, uh, in, a, in a usable state as a toolkit by the end of June this year. Uh, we are working on it, we started working on the code base. You will see the history uh, in, in various forms, but now the final form is in Clojure already a year and a half ago. And again, it's written by Clojure noobs that are learning by doing, but actually it's coming out pretty well. And I am really surprised how fast I go by coding closure. That was one of my first impressions. I go way faster than coding in C. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, but I, I, I'm pretty fast in C. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's so it's um, it it was really really impressive for me how actually it's it's really you know an agile let's say language. So this is uh, more technically what we think it should be, and it is a web application with a RESTful API and, of course, a graphical interface, which is basically not requiring JavaScript, using it only for some styling, and uh, used standalone or integrated in systems. In the worst case, someone that really is desperate and doesn't have the coding power could put it in an iframe of their own CMS or whatever, and I believe it or not, there is people that need to do that, and, um, or integrate it via an API. And actually, uh, it has some features, and this is what we worked on mostly on the back end, that are cryptographically sound. So we have a, what uh, in the Bitcoin world is called multi-signature. We have uh, offline transactions, and we support multiple blockchains uh, backends. We are aiming at supporting them. So one worth the thing, wo thing worth to mention is the multi-signature authentication. I found uh, via Clojure, uh, and then it opened me the Java world, which was, you know, a terrain that where I never wanted to enter because it's a horrible language. So um, uh, through the Java code, I found an implementation of the Samir, Shamir secret sharing, which is very sound in uh, Java. Actually, it seems that it's even better than the one in C, which is the one written by a certain uh, gentleman called Tillman. I adopted this implementation, I ran some tests on it, and I saw it that it's pretty sound if you change it actually using a 4K prime number and using, uh, of course, only integers, large integers. So uh, we wrote something that is based on this library and that splits the keys to the wallet that then goes on a blockchain into nine parts by convention with a quorum of five. So underlying is a system that doesn't store the entire key to the blockchain on a server. On one side, we had a problem. We couldn't develop an application that people would install. This is like hell, you know, for cross-compatibility. We don't even have the capacity. So for us, a web app was necessary. And on the other side, a web app is a threat to security because if you store keys to a blockchain and you lose those keys or someone gets them, then you're done basically, because it's, it's not that you phone and you say, no, I want to cancel that transaction. So what we did is not store all the keys on one server and create a sort of network of servers and even having the possibility to store part of the key, only part of the key, on a card so that you can still recover your access to a blockchain if you lose it and also if the organization, the website goes down or gets hacked, the hackers don't get all the access. So. We went using uh, this sort of stack that uh, um, I can tell you my experience is pretty positive with. Um, I jumped on Liberator right away because it looked good to me. It looked good uh, how I could specify the various steps, like uh, um, you know, like the, the, the conditions, the tracing of conditions also, the debugging that Liberator offers. I, I liked it right away. So um, then we adopted BD and basically Composure. So there are some interesting uh, stories about this adoption. One is uh, in the Hiccup adoption. I stayed with Hiccup while ThoughtWorks with Objective 8, which has a way more complex graphical interface, went for NLive. And we both met a big problem immediately, which was translations, localization. So this is one thing that Clojure really needs to fix. And probably the problem is inherited from Java because Java uses uh, these horrible Java properties things for, for actual <coughs> translation, so like any other asset. Basically, in Clojure, there is still not a GetText compatible um, uh, library. So we had to develop our own uh, way of translating and is not compatible with GetText strings, which is... Um, a minus because actually GetText has all this flooring uh, ecosystem of services like PO Translate that allow you to just put your GetText online and get volunteers translating it, and it's really user friendly. So, one approach that I think we will have is uh, perhaps we, we just wrote our own parsers for a YAML based, uh, yet another markup language based translation, and uh, we have one library that was written for NLive 
which actually is easy loading into NLive strings. And in Freecoin, we have not even a library. It's really like a simple part of code that will substitute the strings with the, what is in the, in the markup. And um, in case of Freecoin, right now we have a hard-coded into the instance, into the installation, an hard-coded language so that uh, you, know, you make an installation, it's in Spanish, it's in Italian, and we'll stay like that. So, but uh, I, I, if you have like uh, fun doing projects that uh, save the world, uh, think of a, a, a smart and backward compatible way to write some string parsing uh, translations because we cannot imagine that the world is all going to speak English. Like if you really hit the ground, it's very important to avoid also this sort of uh, language colonialism. So um, we use Formidable in Freecoin. Uh, when we started using it, there were some bugs. And actually, I can tell you they are getting pretty well fixed. So it's a really interesting library, actually, both for parsing and forming um, uh, forms. Then, of course, Cheshire for JSON parsing. Body hashers is a pretty interesting library for very basic crypto. I think it's, uh, it's very handy. I don't have uh, um, in incredible experiences with Bouncy Castle because that's the backend they use. So the, the old school Java library uh, that is implementing most of the things in Java is called Bouncy Castle. Um, I would prefer having C implementations there. I'm, you know, very close to wearing a tinfoil hat as we commented. So, you know, uh, but I think it's fairly trustable. And if you don't really like give it all your trust and you use also other algorithms, then perhaps it's really, really handy and usable. What you can do with body hashers is encrypt. You can create public and private keys and do all sorts of uh, asymmetric encryption, also symmetric encryption, and you can do also signatures. I'm not sure that if, uh, if elliptic curves are uh, there yet, but then I use secret share. The, 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 the basically, the, I wrap the Tillman library for the Shamir secret sharing. And uh, what we have here is something that we really rely for security. So basically, what is the plan is to reproduce all the operations that are done in Clojure in a C program to have uh, a sort of uh, uh, double check, a sort of replicable uh, computation to see, and, and that's work ongoing. Then QRGen is perfectly fine. And then the testing units, very important, actually, uh, in C, if you code anything more complex and also mission critical, you need to have test units. I've seen that Clojure has a great uh, a tooling for test units. We started using Mija right away. I love Mija. I wake up saying Mija this, Mija that, Mija coffee, Mija thing. It's, it's, it's great. I think it's, uh, I, if anyone knows where this name comes from, it sounds a little bit Dutch, but it's, it's really fun. And, oh, sorry. I, <laughs> My computer protests when I talk too much without clicking it. <coughs> um, then we use both uh, tests internally, so from inside the API, and then of course we do user journeys. So in a very lean way, we just like imagine what a user will do when it makes a transaction from the web, and we use Keradon, and Keradon is absolutely great. Basically, it's very short. You can simulate the interaction with your website by just uh, addressing DOM elements, and you can absolutely simulate step by step how a user would use that form from the outside, which is different than from the inside of the API. One thing is testing your units inside. One thing is really like firing up a phantom website and simulating the clicks. So that's what Keradon does. And you need to have also that coverage. So then you can also stress test and see the performance. And uh, you will be surprised how clear it is, the language to write it. Really, I recommend Keradon. So where is the code? You see it there on the tools. On the right side, you can already see some demos. We have online demos that are built and, and deployed. We have a staging uh, phase and a tooling phase. Uh, we are going forward with, uh, with also with Freecoin. There will be also a live demo online. I can demo it now for you. And basically, um, we are pretty proud to have a GitHub. We are one of the few uh, European projects that have open source uh, and a free and open source clause into the consortium agreement. And actually, we are publishing everything on our own Git and also on GitHub. 
um, I think and I recommend anyone from public sector here, this must be a policy. There is no way that we can use public money without putting it back into the public with an open source license. So it's an internal battle into these sort of things. And uh, that's the thanks where you can contact me. But basically now I can just uh, uh, challenge the demo effect and show you a little bit um, how it looks. It's very boring actually because yeah, here I have the server running. So here I have um, a free coin server. Now this is the, the, the MongoDB for the local uh, deployment. Here I have the free coin running. And here I have um, Stonecutter, which is the SSO and Mooncake running. So oh, Mooncake is already complaining because I should have started it with this because as you can see here I have a script to start because all these, uh, um, all these, uh, uh, they are not demons, all these web apps, they have a uh, client ID and secret. So they need to be authorized. Oh, I don't have uh, really the, the, no, I cannot uh, make it bigger. But no, I, I'm just mentioning like the client ID and secret, they need to be like, this should be passwords so that you authorize these applications to talk to each other. And I forgot to start it through the scripts that have the mockup password. So basically what happens is, this, I go on a landing page in this case, it's in Italian, this installation. And as soon, I was on the port 80,000, as soon as I say, okay, I want to sign in, uh, the program realizes you don't have the session from Stonecutter, so it sends you on the port 5,000 where Stonecutter is running. And this is how it looks like. It's very clean and we also have full capability to actually customize it, change the logos and stuff like that. Um, so I will create an account. And that's what, what happens. Uh, the stone cutter will send you an email that you confirm and uh, you can also customize and code other confirmations in that part and you say, okay, that is your uh, profile is created. Now, because you created the profile directly from another application, you didn't went to Stonecutter to create your identity there, it sends you back immediately to your in original intention, which was to log in into FreeCoin. If you would have had already a login, then it would have told you immediately this, which is the way we describe the action is uh, um, use your profile card. So you have a profile card on Stonecutter and it asks you and it tells you like what is uh, Freecoin asking. It's asking to sign you in and to view your profile card. And uh, Freecoin will not be able to update your profile card. So we have already a system of uh, um, attribute based credentials. So you share your profile card and then you are on Freecoin. It will take your, uh, um, your uh, Gravatar or, your, uh, or what you upload there. You say that your balance is zero and this QR code you can give away to people that want to send you money. So from here on, it's very sim simple. Basically, you want to send an amount to um, 50 to Gino. And this is very basic. So here you can ask uh, a pin it could be asked and that pin could be part of the secret I'm talking about. And then you have a balance of 50 and you can see a list of transactions. And you can also see, now this is uh, the, uh, is it? Oh yeah, 4,000. <coughs> yeah, and you can see the transaction on Mooncake which is also linked to the single sign-on. So it's asking you to sign on and continue with, uh, with our Mooncake. And you can see that the transaction of Alice is up there an hour ago, um, 50 that I just sent. So this is the interface of Mooncake, which is basically the activity streams consumer. 
Mooncake took an activity stream, is pulling activity streams from Freecoin. Actually, it asks the, the application to give, uh, so it's Mooncake that has to decide. So Mooncake comes to your application and says, uh, give me all the events since uh, an hour ago or since two hours ago, and then stores them in its own way. So your application must be ready to take a request for all the activities from two a time. And uh, then Mooncake takes it and will function as a, basically a broker for events for other applications, but also shows it on its own. And then we have a little bit of a semantical uh, representation of activity streams. Basically, activity streams, it is already a format for semantical recognition of what is happening. So you can say, in case of a transaction, uh, something better than what I'm saying here. Uh, in case of creating an objective, uh, it could be said uh, uh, Alice uh, created an objective, and Bob is participating to it, and so on and so forth. This must be worked as a semantical model, basically. And uh, that's it. I could create other users, uh, but perhaps uh, there are questions. Any questions? Yeah. Hi, first of great presentation. Really loved it. I have two questions, and I don't know if they're a bit dense. But did I understand correctly that uh, the basic storage for Freecoin is a distributed blockchain? Ah, so thank you. Uh, well, I forgot to say about that. What we found um, in the research, also interacting with other partners, is that all this hype about blockchains created a real big movement of you know startups doing very different things, actually masking what they are doing. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, there are products like StoreJ that started from counterparty and never actually quoted that, and then that is an obsolete technology already, so they're going on their own. We found an incredible amount of claims and projects that were not reliable for serious terms, and we had serious questions on how maintainable they are in the future. So what we really concentrated on is another uh, component, which is the middleware to interact with a blockchain. And our vision is to interact with a blockchain that of choice in the moment in which that is needed. So there is an abstract API, which is internally in the blockchain CLG, which has, uh, we, we run some tries on NXT, and it's basically an, um, uh, how do you say, a, a abstract class in uh, Clojure becomes um, a, a protocol, yes. Uh, we have a protocol that is the blockchain um, API that is most found across blockchains. So the vision is to try it out on smart contracts, on Eris, Ethereum, to try it out on uh, NXT, on uh, liquid uh, sidechains and stuff like that. So this was my actual second question, so we want to Thank you. Thank you for the question because I forgot to specify it. It's, a, it's an important part. I mean, we really want to develop something that communities can rely on. That's why the test units are very important. And we really want to take up a little bit of responsibility in saying, okay, this thing must be secure, you know? Uh, I mean, it's fairly secure, let's say. So uh, the, the paranoia was also like, okay, and then, and then we put a backend which is developed <laughs> since six months by, you know, uh, you know, such fantastic, very trendy, <laughs> like, you know. Uh, so. Yeah, hi, uh, on, on that note, uh, you've got four services and you're saying Mooncake asks uh, Freecoin for its activity. How do you guarantee the authenticity of these requests between the services? How do, do I guarantee the activity? How, How do you guarantee the authenticity of requests between services? Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, actually a tricky question. Uh, most of it must be guaranteed on a level of uh, system administration. So one thing you would have is like this uh, uh, authentication model, and then, oh, sorry, that was dis disconnected. Ah, sorry. Um, this authentication model is something that you would have. But also you would have a firewall, probably, on the server that uh, really authenticates and, you know, like on a sysadmin level, you can really create a VPN and, and these sort of things. So you but don't need the CPI? 
that is something that I would already say, yeah, it's on the sysadmin level. But yes, you can use PKI. Um, it seems you, you don't like uh, to use closure script or JavaScript. Why is that? I like uh, uh, to use closure script. I'm trying to look into it. But in this case, the requirement is really to be uh, fully compatible with all sorts of needs. And believe it or not, there is people out there using Netscape, you know, Internet Explorer, from the ages of, uh, of uh, the doom. So basically, uh, you know, we need to be able to serve uh, everyone and not create limitations. Eventually, I, I, I thought of having a WAP. <laughs> Anyone here remembers WAP? <laughs> I thought of having a WAP interface. <laughs> then we could go and having a goofer one. But basically, uh, so, you know, it's, and also, uh, the, the browser nowadays is a huge attack surface. So if any attacks comes in, it's from the browser, from a plugin, from a flash. It's the place where actually a lot of uh, dirty stuff happens. So we don't want to rely too much on that in, in this case. Really keep it minimal. Uh, for this mooncake layer, you're saying that it's going to take like a buffer of time, for, so a start to a stop. Once mooncake has that, uh, like you know, that list of events, uh, what other dimensions are you like planning to query on that, or or is there something more to that? Um, that is something to be explored. So there is one middleware that mooncake is using, and that Objective Eight starts using, which is called Coracle. So um, Coracle is actually a layer in between Mooncake, Objective-8, and the database. This is more software developed by ThoughtWorks. And I've seen that they have built um, Coracle as a middleware so that they can switch easily and run certain operations between MongoDB, uh, Datomic, and other services that are being tested. So I think there is going to be some development, if especially there is take up for this technology, uh, in, in that direction. But we don't have an extended uh, development already. Um, this is all mobile friendly, but it's a web app. No, we don't plan to build a mobile application. So it's, we don't plan to build a fully decentralized system that runs on mobiles without a server. It's uh, too big of a challenge for such a small project at the end uh, on one side. On the other side is uh, really difficult to find the right technology again because not everyone has a smartphone. Actually, the majority of people that we work with, they don't have a smartphone. And uh, within that group, the majority likes to not have a smartphone. So we, we cannot fence people out of that. Uh, of, of a system in that way. So we thought that a web app would be uh, the best. Okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, so you're building a web application, you need to write some uh, JavaScript, I suppose, some scripts running on those pages. Now you just said in answer to, um, to a previous question that uh, you're choosing not to use ClojureScript because there are things out there like Netscape and you, uh, and so I, pr I presume that you mean that you want to cater to those people using Netscape and certainly IE6 and stuff. So, um, so my question is, uh, like, what's your strategy for actually supporting those? Because, well, uh, I tend to use things like Closure Script and so the Closure with an S, right? Google Closure Library Event System or React Synthetic Event System. Uh, because uh, because I have no hope of ever being able to support uh, even the range of browsers, the limited range of browsers that I'm currently able to support, um, if I actually had to implement a synthetic event system myself. I'm, I just don't even want to get into the, the business of doing that. So uh, so going beyond that level of support uh, to, um, to to something like Nets like.
just uh, get post, you know. And as you see, uh, all the operations I've done, they implied a uh, reload, like the good old times. Like, you know, before writing closure, I was writing CGIs in C. And actually, they're very hard to be act, because no one knows what's in there. <laughs> I mean, even if you publish the, the code, it's, it takes some, some effort more. And um, yeah, I think that the, the pure strategy is that of uh, doing a get post thing. We do use some JavaScript. There is some bootstrap, some jQuery in there, but it must not be mandatory for completing the operation. So basically, uh, many people also that I know, actually people I work with, they have JavaScript uh, deactivated on their browsers, believe it or not, like really do not have JavaScript, because it's, it's uh, you know, Sometimes it's even acting like spyware, connects around and does metrics, and some people don't like to have that. So basically, um, we need to cater to those people as well, really. So it's get, post, you know, uh, redirect, in this case, like the good old times of the CGIs. And the closure works perfect also for that. The only thing is with, uh, JavaScript must not be necessary to complete the operation. And I recommend, actually, if you want, if you have clients in India or in China or, uh, you know, in, in places that have less impact, uh, like high-tech technology, um, it's, it's very convenient because you, you have more, uh, more audience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.